Merry Christmas Eve, everyone. Or if you are watching one of the countless times Nine News will re-air this special over the holiday season, happy... Kick back, relax, and enjoy some of the most memorable stories we've shared over the last year. And enjoy the 12 jackets of Christmas. So Colorado was spared a catastrophic wildfire year in 2021 after 2020's worst year on record. That history is being preserved in many forms, including through the paint of an artist in Parker. Our Ann Herbst has that. Okay. With each teeny tiny tap of Jay Moore's brush. So I'm designing as I go here. A memory comes to life, even in a simple sketch. You know, a moose wandering out while you're just standing there. You know, foxes that come and play right in front of you. Though beauty is a constant, Jay has seen Colorado's landscapes transform over time. You know, say 25 or 30 years, you see changes, you know, like obviously fires, like the East Troublesome Fire that burned nearly 200,000 acres in Grand County and changed so many places Jay has painted. Here the lake is just like glass. They are paintings that people like Barbara Pierce admire. I was looking at this wall and you can see there are a significant number of studies. 40 or 50 little sketches of different scenes. And by golly, my eye went straight to this one. She kind of zeroed into this one. She says, tell me about this one. And Jay said, oh, that's up by Granby. And Granby has a, is a special place in my life because I spent many summers there with my family. And so I told her, you know, that that was from the area that had burned up by Granby and, and that scene doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, we all started getting goosebumps. And so I'm like, okay, let me, let me get to work here and I'll show it to you when it's finished. But the feeling is there, the sunlight, the sparkle. The Barbara knew she needed to buy it the instant the paint had finally dried. I am a lucky girl because I'll get to see this every single day. I love doing a painting that I can hit somebody with, like, you know, hit them really deep. A snapshot of time the fire can't take away. It will return in a different way, but it will come back and we will all be able to enjoy it again. In the meantime, Jay will help us remember. That's why I get up in the morning and paint every day. And let his brush do its magic. And the rest seems to take care of itself. Until nature does hers. For next, this is Ann Herbst. That first story was from April. We caught up with Jay again in October when he revisited one of his favorite spots in Rocky Mountain National Park after it burned in the East Troublesome Fire. These trees have fallen down into the water that obviously weren't there. The river has changed its path. There used to be a little sandbar. Flames must have just been licking through here like balls of fire. It's part of the forest and part of the cycle. And we just happen to be living in that part of the cycle. I still love this spot. It's like, a, it's like you can't fall out of love with this spot. This is my spot. Now more than ever, Moore says he appreciates the poetry that comes from imperfection. So 2021 was a year of resilience for Coloradans who had been impacted by natural disasters in the year before. Ha Valley Ranch is one of our most popular open space areas in North Boulder County near Lyons. And it was the location of uh, about half of the Calwood fire. So our project right now is to try and stabilize the slopes and prevent erosion from happening in the monsoons. We really have a lot of work ahead of us to stabilize the soils, and it's going to mean a lot of contractors in here. It's gonna mean helicopters flying and mulch dropping from the helicopters. Using helicopters is about the only way to access a lot of this terrain since it's pretty steep and rugged. Most of these trees are hazard trees that have been removed from along our roads and trails. It's kind of a nice closed loop here that we can remove trees that are hazard, produce these wood shreds, and then we can then put on the slopes for uh, hill slope sta stabilization. We have targeted 1,500 acres for aerial mulching. He's got to swing wide to gain enough altitude to get up to the top of the slope. We're doing about five tons an acre. So it's a lot of helicopter trips. It's really critical to get some cover on the slopes to prevent erosion, debris flows, flooding. Um, it's the research has shown it's one of the single best things you can do in that critical first and second year after post fire. Having the helicopters for the aerial for the for the immediate fire response and the defense, and then now for the recovery as well. Yeah, it points to how critical this resource is, this aerial resource. There he goes. Your time. 
We are doing some fire recovery seating today. And we're kind of entering into um, the burn area of these slopes now. Try and stabilize the slopes where it burned really hot and a lot of regrowth is not happening. The trees are completely torched and when it gets to that point, that becomes really uh, more devastating. The soils, they lose a lot of their um, organic matter. Diversity is resiliency, really. Um, and that holds true in a lot of facets of society, but it also holds true in um, our ecosystems too. If you have a diverse landscape, you then will have a diverse wildlife population and suites of populations that helps to safeguard from different uh, natural disasters. Go and light on the seed. Fire is an integral part of our ecosystem. And here in the Front Range, we've suppressed fire for the last 140 years. And so we have forests that are overgrown, that aren't used to fire, and that are unhealthy. You know, we certainly cannot control Mother Nature by any means, but I think the more that we try to learn from Mother Nature and work with Mother Nature, the more successful we'll be at mitigating um, some damaging impacts from large-scale natural disasters, as well as stewarding these lands as best as possible. The southern portion of Hile Valley Ranch is still closed. Boulder County Open Space says it's going to stay shut off until the public until at least spring of 2022. So you know that feeling where somebody's really amped about something that they love and it kind of gets everybody around them excited too? That's a good strategy for teaching high school. And it is out of this world strategy if you're a high school teacher who got to work with NASA over the summer. The more we learn about asteroids, the more we can learn about how our solar system formed. And that's why we're sending so many missions to asteroids right now. Bob MacArthur is a teacher at Highlands Ranch High School. He was one of 28 educators to work with NASA's Airborne Astronomy Program, going on research flights where they used infrared astronomy. We can look for water on the moon. We can study star formation, uh, planet formation. And uh, it's really important to have infrared astronomy for, uh, for that. And we got to be part of that. MacArthur actually applied for this back in November of 2019. Then the flights all got delayed by the pandemic. He was the only teacher selected out of Colorado. So there's an elementary school in Evans with quite the well-traveled group of students. A fifth grade teacher at Dos Rios Elementary got creative this year in order to show her students the world during the pandemic. What's the cheapest souvenir you can buy in any place? A postcard. Ooh, a postcard. Like, postcard. So I'm Braden Riley. Um, kids here call me Miss Riley. Oh my gosh. Okay, so we have. And I teach fifth grade to 19 awesome kiddos. I live in Queensland, Australia, suburb of Brisbane, called Salisbury. Weather, very hot, little clouds. 28 degrees Celsius. I thought, okay, how can I give my kids the world? Because I really wish I could. And I decided that they asked to go different places. So I said, okay, well, let me bring the world to them. I've got another postcard from Japan. It's pretty cool design. He lives in Japan, but he's from India. Definitely tried to get postcards from places that they're passionate about and want to go to someday or hopefully live and work in Dubai. Um, I got a um, French pen pal. He speaks Turkish. Turkish and English and Japanese. There's good people and kind people everywhere as shown by this project because so many people said, yep, I'll send a postcard. Just send me the address and send me the kid's name. And so I appreciate her stepping out, doing something different, being a risk taker to motivate kids. Hello, Miss Campos's class. My class was like, okay, well, we have to share the love. We have to get postcards for every student at Dos Rios. I definitely did not think that um, it would be expanded to pass this class, but um, I definitely am really glad that my class made that comment saying, you know, everybody should get one. Thank you. We give you opportunities to have a piece of the world. So these all came for you from internationally. I hope that they take away to just, that they know that they can go anywhere. Wave to your grown-ups. Hello. Hi, Mom. Hello. Okay. It's really, really awesome to see their joy in it, the same joy I had giving it to them. Thank you very much, fifth grade. Ms. Riley and her class shared those adventures with us this past May, meaning those world travelers are now grown up sixth graders.
We love to explore and learn about Colorado's neighborhoods on Next, and we're so thankful that you have gone on those adventures with us for five plus years now. Over the summer, Anusha Roy took us to Five Points, where growth has inspired some complicated conversations about culture and even neighborhood lines. All right, family, y'all give me two seconds. Community is more than a word. Family give us about like 25 to 30 minutes. It's taking care of each other. Thank you. And having difficult conversations. Let me see. Like the ones happening at the Welton Street Cafe at the heart of Five Points, where there is some honest talk about black history and how to preserve it. My blood, sweat, and tears goes into this neighborhood. It's that heartbeat. Okay, what color, baby? Fatima Dickerson, who helps run the cafe, says okay. is slowing down to the point of vanishing. The black community wants to make sure we still have a place in Five Points. You know what I'm saying? We still want to make sure we have a place along the Welton Corridor. Fatima says there are literally signs the history of Five Points is being diluted as businesses further away from the main corridor take on the Five Points name. It's almost like there's an erasure, a removal of the actual people because even though it's including the name, like who are the representatives. I took a trip on the train. Tonight, you are going to experience the sounds of five points. It's a conversation Purnell Steen, a local musician, has been having for years. The kind of music he plays is the music he heard growing up along the Walton Street corridor. Cultural history of my ancestors, that's the story that we are telling through jazz. Five Points became a place of solidarity for the black community through the years. We had barber shops, beauty shops, as I said, record stores. We had all of the infrastructural businesses to be self-contained. It was a place of camaraderie, fun. A place musicians would come from across the country to visit. And to see especially brown skin entertainers, wow. Now Steen says the name is wandering further from the heart of this historically black neighborhood with new developments, new money, and new faces. This is where things get complicated. Technically, the Five Points neighborhood is much larger than the Welton Street corridor. The city map shows it bordering Downing Street, following 20th Street, including Coors Field, and up the South Platte River. So we're on the corner of Brighton Boulevard and 35th in the heart of the Art District, and also in Five Points. It's why Tracy Wheel, the executive director of the Rhino Art District, said they put up signs like this throughout the neighborhood. You know, we're not here to usurp a name. We're here to, you know, create and respect for those neighborhoods. There's people that think that in around Welton Street that that's really Five Points, and there's people that also think that the entire uh, map that, you know, the city of Denver has out, out there that kind of defines all the neighborhoods is Five Points. So. It just depends on who you talk to, frankly. Odell Brewery also changed their name from Rhino Brew House on Larimer Street to the Five Points Brew House. They said no to an interview, but did tell us they did not do this for the marketing, but to honor the neighborhood. After doing their research and talking to community organizations, the brewery also said they trained their staff about the history. I get the, the part of inclusion, like we want to include it, because even being a part of the Neighborhood Association, like, our boundaries are more than just the corridor, so I get that piece. We started this series to bring intentionality back to jazz in the Five Points neighborhood. To try and preserve Five Points history, people like Gertie Harris with Fireside at Five. I am going to bring up the band now. Worked with Steen to put on a jazz festival at Tracks on 35th and Walnut. I think the biggest thing for us is we wanted to book artists that really embody and champion that Harlem of the West culture in modern day Mile High. We've compiled QR codes where people can learn about the different bars that used to be open on Welton Street and, and hear about nonprofit organizations like Welton Street Renaissance Project. Mr. Turner will be right with you. He came in yesterday, had a cafe sandwich with no tartar sauce. But on Walton Street, Fatima is raising the question. Doing well. Who are people learning this history from? When people are trying to make, make claim to a name or a place, when you're not a part of the story, you're telling the story from observation and not through lived experiences. I'm here 
every day. Ultimately, the community seems to want to take care of the history behind their name. Five Points is about the people. Five Points is about connection. But it might mean more tough conversations. Let's find a way to work together. And collaboration. Welton Street Cafe. For next. You want them seasoned or regular? I'm Anusha Roy. An important conversation and one that's sure to continue as Denver grows and changes. Our thanks again to our Anusha Roy and photo journalist Mike Grady. There are no grizzly bears in Colorado, or so they say. They said that for decades and then one mauled a hunter in 1979. They're pretty sure now in Parks and Wildlife that the grizzlies are in fact gone. Rewind a few generations back and grizzlies were so feared and one was so legendary that it deserved a legendary tale on next. I present the Ballad of Old Moe's. We used to have grizzlies here, and this is a story of a very scary grizzly. Old Moe's a grizzly bear wandering Colorado at the turn of the 20th century. Eating cows and scaring folks and ravaging the countryside. Old Moe's a grizzly bear, what a story. Some said that he was named by two old timers that uh, were impressed with the way that he would mosey um, into a miner's camp and then um, scare the man witless and then mosey off. Old Mosey killed some folks in Southern Colorado, so some people started hunting him down. Warden Pig, he caught him in a trap, he thought he had him, but old Mosey found his way out. That's just the resilience of old Mose. you know, he, he can get shot and survive, he's, he's stuck in a trap, chew his own toes off and survive. Old Mose the grizzly bear didn't roam free for long, for Warden Pig, he mustered up his posse. He friend Mr. Anthony shot the beast and killed him dead. Old Moe's a grizzly bear, what a story. When he was eventually killed was that they, they looked at, Mr. Pig looked at the, the feet and was like, yeah, there's there's two toes missing. Old Moe's the grizzly bear, what a story. Photo journalist Mike Grady brought us that banjo ballad. So about 15 years ago, Adam State changed its mascot to the Grizzlies and there's a statue of Old Moe's on the campus in Alamosa. has a variety of wildlife, but it's us humans that tend to cause a lot of the problems or are at least mixed up in that trouble. So take the case of the bighorn sheep on Mount Evans. Researchers hoping to keep them away from humans found a solution in the form of pee. If you think our number two reporter Noel Brennan is a real whiz, you're in luck. What's up, Rita? Building trust with bighorn sheep Hi. takes time. Come on, Lucy. Jess Harrington's patience pays off. That is a first, yeah. That moment she feels for the first time, a sheep tongue. That was pretty awesome. That's like the highlight of my at least month. The highlight of the year comes at the peak of North America's highest paved road. Mount Evans is a really awesome place to go. The Denver Zoo sent Harrington and fellow researchers to Mount Evans to learn about the source of salt that bighorn sheep and mountain goats love to lick. Where is it that, that these salt sources are coming from and is that the root cause of the problem that's attracting animals in? As they study what draws wildlife to humans, they got curious. What might drive them away? It turns out that mountain lion urine is commercially available. Um, you can buy it like on Amazon. 
<laughs> the zoo bought it by the bucket. 40 bucks per gallon or so, like it's not, it's not outrageous. And took it to the parking lots of Mount Evans. Our conservation vehicle smelled like urine for probably about a week or two after we transported up there. So I basically walk around with a jug and then like a metering stick um, that counts every 10 feet and then pour and so on. They set up cameras to see how a predator's pee affects other animals. We're hoping that bringing that that scent of the mountain lion urine up to where they're at in the summer, it'll stimulate that survival response or that survival mechanism and keep them away from those areas. If it works, a researcher's career may reach its peak. Yes, yeah. For next, I'm Noel Brennan. Next summer, researchers hope to create fake bighorn sheep tongues to see how they collect salt on different surfaces. Noel Brennan is marking his calendar. So there it is, some of Next's most memorable stories of 2021 and the 12 Jackets of Christmas. 11. Oh, you're kidding me. All right, we got time for this? All right, here we go. All right, thank you again for joining us for some of Next's most memorable stories of 2021 and the 12 Jackets of Christmas. See you next time.